hello, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, it uh, certainly is a pleasure for us. Uh, before we begin, I want to say on behalf of the United Nations, the World Genesis Foundation, and all of our academy participants, instructors, and managers, we really want to thank you and welcome you here to the Atlantic Crown Summer Academy of LARP. Again, thank you so much. And thank you, and I hope the conference goes well for you. Well, I think it will. At this moment, uh, you'll be speaking to about 500 instructors and guests from all around the world. Uh, they're really in a little bit of a unique environment. They're actually sitting outdoors right now in an amphitheater underneath the stars on a very small island in a remote wilderness area in the Danube Delta near the Black Sea. And what's really special to us, uh, for everybody at this program, these youth who are about at that age where they're preparing to begin their adult lives and careers, instead of going on a typical summer vacation, they decided to travel here to learn and study many things with experts uh, like yourself from all around the world. And I have to say, uh, your appearance here has been a high point, and they've really been eagerly awaiting this opportunity to hear your words and to speak with you. So it'd probably be wise for me not to keep them waiting any longer based upon uh, uh, their eagerness to, uh, to speak with you tonight. Good. Well, I wish them well in their careers, and uh, hope we can say them something that's important to them. Well, you know, as, as we we're preparing for this, uh, we, of course, uh, spoke with many of the youth about the questions they'd like to ask you. But in an interview, I have to say, uh, it's really posed quite a challenge. Uh, I've looked at your life, and you've lived such a remarkable life. You've had success in so many fields, including your achievements in life as a scientist, as a test pilot, a naval officer, an astronaut, even as an entrepreneur, and a very well-published author. Uh, you've explored outer space, uh, your achievements in space exploration, even walking on the moon, and you've even spun that career into making great achievements in the exploration of inner space through your groundbreaking research into consciousness. And now what we see as, uh, as you start another phase in your life, you've turned your attention, skills, and experience and commitment to the issue of creating a sustainable future here on Earth. So, as you can see as an interviewer, you know, where do I start? There are just many places to begin, but I have to say one of the first most popular questions are from the youth here, what did it feel like to walk on the moon for the first time? Well, my response to that is, uh, for young people particularly, is what more can an explorer want than to go where humans have never been? to look around, take pictures, gather samples, and come back and tell you what we saw. And so, what more can an explorer want? That's the high point of your career right there, is to go where humans have never been and tell about it. Yeah, amazing. You know, the uh, those moments have uh, been such an inspiration uh, for so many people on this planet. Uh, I really love the documentary in the uh, in the shadow of the moon and in the opening line, do, we, do you remember when the whole world looked up as, as one uh, to the sky? And then that actually raises another question that people have been discussing here. Uh, when we look at the Apollo program and your exploration of space with others, uh, it achieves so many objectives, scientific and other. But when you look back now with the hindsight of all these years, what do you believe was truly the greatest achievements of the program for human society? Well, I certainly think uh, that it will go down in history as the beginning of humankind becoming extraterrestrial. Uh, let's take it in a long, long run. You know, our star system, in particular our sun, only has a finite lifetime like all stars. So we have to be out of here in uh, a billion years or so. <laughs> and uh, no place to begin like the beginning now. And so we have to start our uh, forays out into the universe, starting with our own solar system. And we've gone to the moon. Uh, next, we will probably go to Mars and to the asteroids, and perhaps in some of the other planets. But ho likely, if we don't blow ourselves up in the, in the meantime with stupidities, uh, we should be able to get outside of our solar system, uh, for certainly within the next 100 years or so. Well, that's, that's absolutely amazing, a hundred-year time frame. What do you think will be the, the next great achievement or step that these youth will see when it comes to space exploration in their lifetime? Well, the next step is most likely we will go back to the moon, I'm sure, in due course, but uh, uh, helping to create more sustainability because we're using resources at an alarming rate, 
and expanding our activities uh, to the moon and to the asteroid belt is probably the next step because we can possibly use those resources and learning to use solar energy from the in space and beaming it back down to Earth is probably uh, uh, one of the next major steps. And it's, it's things like that of learning to live uh, more sustainably on this on the, our own planet that is our big challenge at the moment. Yes, I, I as a student of all the Apollo missions and the space programs, so much. Uh, uh, good technology um, that could alleviate suffering and a disaster here on Earth has come out of those programs. So certainly that would be uh, uh, very fascinating to see those next steps. Um, another question that comes up quite often is, as we begin that, as a human society, as we begin that exploration of space, the next phase, what are your views about life outside of Earth and what we might encounter first? Well, I have been doing a great deal of study in that particular area recently and in the process of writing a book on it right now. But uh, I think we have been visited. Uh, there's no question in my mind that there are undoubtedly thousands of civilizations out in the universe that we have no inkling of at this point, except for the fact a few of them may have, have visited us and uh, have been doing so for quite some time. You know, the historical record would seem to suggest uh, there is evidence throughout the last several hundred years of periodic visitations in all cultures, uh, chariots in the sky, this sort of thing that is recorded in the historical record in quite a number of cultures. So it would appear that uh, life is prevalent throughout the universe and uh, certainly more advanced than we because they've been able to come to us and we haven't been able to go to them yet. Wouldn't it be a, a, a tremendous opportunity as a young person to be uh, living in a generation when the first public contact with uh, life outside of Earth happened? It would be absolutely amazing. Well, I think that's exactly what our young people are, are right now. They just may not know it because it would seem that in the current period, my government, our government here in the United States has certainly been instrumental or a part of the process of keeping this hidden from the public. And there's a, a, a large amount of evidence that uh, that has happened. But we ho we're hoping that we can push this disclosure uh, point, this disclosure issue, and open this up so people do indeed know that we have been visiting. Yeah, there are so many uh, that have gone so far, efforts that have gone so far beyond grassroots movements. I've even seen in the European Union the European Union now is clamoring for a disclosure. So it would be fascinating to watch what happens, and I will encourage the youth to do that. Yes, I'm, I'm certainly that this is likely to happen, certainly in the decade ahead of us. Wow, that's, that's very exciting. And as a matter of fact, I think from a, from a standpoint of growing and learning as a human society, uh, full disclosure and transparency and the learning that can come from that as an individual or as a society is so important. So I do hope you're right, and uh, uh, this does develop in this manner. Well, I certainly hope so, too. And uh, one of the main things we humans have to learn to do if we're going to be a move out as to being a... Uh, outreach society and a space society, I have often said in my lectures to young people, hopefully in particular, that we will go to Mars in due course. But when we go to Mars and look back at this tiny little speck we call Earth, it'll sound counter foolish to say we came from the United States or Canada or England or Germany or Israel or wherever. No, we came from Earth. And that we're not ready to do that yet, but we need to be very shortly. So well said. Actually, it's, it's one of the themes at the Academy this year is the Alliance of Civilization and the world working together as one, and I hope we'll see those lines fall. I totally but, agree with you. But, you know, there's so much uh, learning and growing and changing we have to do, but um, rewinding for a moment, uh, it's such a remarkable experience. It's hard for many of the youth here, as we spoke with them, to imagine what it's like to actually experience uh, uh, space and to be able to look back from the moon and to see the Earth rising. Um, how did your experience in space, uh, mm -hmm. the moon, change you? Did it change you in any way? And if yes, could you tell us more yes, about that? That particular experience that you just described was indeed the high point, the created an epiphany, and I'll describe that very briefly here. 
my responsibility on my lunar mission was that of lunar module pilot, which meant I had to have the lunar spacecraft, uh, like all pilots, know your ship like the back of your hand and uh, know all the systems and what to do with this, what happens and that happens. <clears throat> and uh, being lunar module pilot, I was also responsible for the scientific experiments we set up on the moon. We were the first mission to begin to do real science on the moon, and so that was my responsibility. <clears throat> so when that was all done and we started home, I had a little more relaxed schedule uh, than my partners. We all had work to do, but I had successfully completed most of my work and got the chance to look out the window a little bit and just enjoy the scenery. And we had oriented the spacecraft for thermal balance purposes perpendicular to the ecliptic, which is a plane that contains the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, and we're perpendicular to that, and we're rotating so that we could keep thermal balance on the spacecraft from the solar rays. And what that allowed to have happen was every two minutes, the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, and a 360-degree panorama of the heavens appeared in the spacecraft window. And that was a wow experience. That was really something because I realized from my days of studying astronomy at Harvard and MIT that um, the molecules of my body and the molecules in spacecraft were either manufactured or prototyped in some ancient generation of stars. And suddenly those were my molecules and I was connected to those stars. And that was a, 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 an unbelievable experience accompanied by ecstasy and excitement and it continued all the way home every time I had a moment not from work and got to look at the heavens uh, this was an experience that repeated itself an ecstasy and once I got home it was, it was so powerful I had to try to understand what this was all about and I started digging in the science literature and nothing and, and in the uh, religious literature and nothing and finally, I appealed to some anthropologists to help me find answers to this. And we realized in the Sanskrit, they discovered in the Sanskrit, was a description called samadhi, which means to see things in their separateness as we do with our eyes, but to experience them as a one, as a unity, as connected, uh, and accompanied by ecstasy, which is what I was doing in space. And subsequently learning that virtually every culture somewhere back in their history uh, has a similar description of feeling this unity of oneness with everything. And so that was really the high point of uh, this experience was because of seeing Earth from space, seeing all of this ecstasy and this magnificence of the universe itself, it was really the high point. You know, it's amazing when you look, it, it seems like today science is simply now rediscovering that ancient wisdom of all those beliefs that basically said we were all connected and part of the same one. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, what do you think it will take for uh, uh, the world to come to this realization uh, as a whole, as a majority well, of the society? Virtually all of our religious traditions in their cloistered orders, in their meditation studies, uh, have moved people along that path. Unfortunately, uh, those who have not had that type of experience and get all caught up in the ego system of me, me, me instead of service to the greater good, uh, seldom get to find that. You have to work at it a little bit. And um, uh, that's what we need to do is people be more fall more in love with nature and see themselves as a part of nature and uh, go to the mountaintop, go to the seashore, uh, go into the forest and commune with the animals. That brings us closer to these types of experiences where we realize everything is all united, it's all a part of the same thing. And our, our task is to work together, love and enjoy it, as opposed to being destructive, killing each other, and competing to see who's got the best God and this, that, and the other. <laughs>